All right, so we're going to be in chapters uh, 9 and 10 tonight. And uh, the topic tonight is really wisdom, and it picks up from where we left off last week. Uh, chapter 8, Solomon kind of broached the subject of wisdom, that wisdom is... Uh, Insufficient. Wisdom's wonderful, wisdom's great, but wisdom alone is not enough, and he's going to pick it back up in chapter 9. So we're going to just launch into it there tonight. So we're going to read these first series of verses because they're going to set up for us where we're going to go tonight. And he's going to talk about wisdom, but also about some of the things he sees in life. Remember, we're trying to understand his view of life from his perspective. It's not always right. Uh, he's sometimes very off base in terms of his conclusion. Many times he's very accurate. So we have to be really careful how we take what he says and how we apply it to our own lives. So in verse 1 of chapter 9 he says, But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. That's going to be a really important statement as we move on. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. So when he's talking about whether it's love or hate, he's talking about the love or hate of God. We don't know. We're not really always sure, is God angry with me? Is God not angry with me? Is he in love with me? Is he not in love with me? If we view things from a human perspective alone. So he goes on in verse 2, it's the same for all since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. And that same event, he's going to mention several times in these verses, is death, as you'll see in just a second. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. What's the event? Death. Also, the hearts of the men, children of man are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. There's my favorite verse. And somebody graciously made me a t-shirt with that on it. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Tells you wonders uh, about his view of the afterlife. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is under the sun. So six verses that are jam-packed. What's he talking about? Well, tonight we're going to try to look at eight different aspects of wisdom that he's going to address, some of which are very, very applicable to our lives. Others, because of, I think, his flawed viewpoint, are a little less applicable, but there's truth in them nonetheless. So the first one's going to be this. He's talked about a lot of things in these verses, but he says their deeds, the righteous and the unrighteous, are what? In the hand of God. He's going to give you and I his view of the eternalness of God, the sovereignty of God. He believed that God was sovereign and in control. All things, whether you're righteous or unrighteous, are in his hands. Ultimately, he's in control. And so that's an important thing for us to understand as we listen to him. He does have a good view of God and his eternality. He says both the righteous and the wise and then the unrighteous and the fool, as he'll talk about in later verses, are before God. They live their lives before God. Now one of the things he's going to talk about in a minute is that sometimes it appears as if the fools get away with it. As if God just turns his back and go, well, he's a fool. I'll just let him live his life. But Solomon understands through his wisdom, through life experience, that ultimately God's in control of both of their lives. Both live their lives for form. It's the same for both. So God is a God of eternity. And uh, that's an important thing for us to recognize, even though you're, you're probably sitting there going, well, I knew that. But do you live like it? Do you live as if you believe that God is the God of eternity, that God has no beginning and no end, that God is all-powerful, all-knowing? He can look into your life and my life. He can look into the life of any individual, and he can see the beginning and the end because he already knows the beginning and the end. God is in complete control. He is eternal. He is supernatural, and he is sovereign. So this is his way of saying God's in control. And... Uh, 
What you got to understand is when you're talking about Solomon and when you're listening to Solomon, he has that perspective that has a limitation built into it. And it's the Hebrew perspective of an Old Testament Hebrew that they don't know what the future holds. They don't know what's after the grave. They know there's something, but they aren't sure what it is. And so he has a limited understanding of this eternal nature of God. He doesn't get eternity. Well, the truth is, I don't get eternity. I don't fully comprehend eternity, what that means and what that looks like. I don't know what an eternal state is going to feel like, be like, because I'm a limited human being who lives within space and time, and I know, I know what time feels like, and I know what getting old feels like, and I think I know what death may be like, but I don't know what eternity is going to be like. So he's got a limited perspective, and he brings that to the equation. But he does know this, that all men's lives, whether they're good, they're bad, they're evil, they're wicked, they're righteous, whether they give sacrifices or don't give sacrifices, are in God's hands. And, and we read that and we think, well, yeah, that's, that's right. That's a good thing. But sometimes Solomon sees it as a negative thing because he sees the incongruities and the inconsistencies that take place in life between the evil and the good. And he goes, I don't get it. We're both in God's hands but why does he succeed and I fail? Why does he get away with murder literally and I, I can't get off with anything? But he does believe God's in control. And you hear in his voice in these verses that resignation and, and resentment of Okay, God, you're in control, but what are you doing? Why are you letting these things happen? And, and if you're anything like me, you've, you've had those feelings, right? When you see something unjust happen, or maybe something unjust happens to you, and you go, why me? There are men in this room who I know their stories, and they've, they've lost loved ones unexpectedly. And you can't help but go, Why? Why is this happening? And you can't help but sometimes question the love of God and the wisdom of God. And why would you do this? And this is what, really what he's doing because he is so focused on this life. And he doesn't understand the afterlife. So he focuses on this life and he can't understand why do the wicked get away with their wickedness? And why do the evil or why do the, the righteous seem to suffer so much? But see, he's got a limited perspective. He says this, it's the same for all. What's the same for all? It's this thing that ultimately leads in death. The wicked, the righteous, all die. And, and see, he sees that as not a positive. He sees it as a negative. You know, I don't mind when wicked people die. To tell you the truth, I don't really mind at all. But I hate to see righteous people die. I hate to see godly people die. But guess what? They both die. And guess what? God's in control. And guess what? God knows the death date of every person who lives on this planet. He knows. He's in control. He's eternal. And death is common to every one of us. So what's his conclusion? Enjoy life. And he tells us, enjoy life because this is your reward. This is one of those um, statements from Solomon that we need to reject out of hand. It sounds nice, but it's wrong. He says, enjoy your life. This is your reward. Now, the enjoy your life part is not wrong. You should enjoy your life. You should enjoy your family, your kids. Um, Sometime within the next probably hour, I've got a daughter-in-law who's going to give birth to a, my sixth grandchild, and I'm going to rejoice in that, and that's wonderful, and it's great, and if the, my prayer is the baby's healthy, and she's healthy, and we should rejoice in those things. Rejoice in your job, your marriage, your kids, your grandkids, your health. But he says, this is your reward, and that's where he gets squirrely. Because his viewpoint is totally focused on this life. The word he uses in the Hebrew is this, this Hebrew word, shalek. And it means your portion, your share, your inheritance. That's literally what the word means. It's your inheritance. So what he's telling you is, enjoy this life because this is what you get. This is it. 
This is your inheritance. But we know from the rest of the Bible and especially the New Testament and the Gospels in particular that that's not our inheritance. This is not our inheritance. We can enjoy blessings here, but this is not the end. This is not all we get. That's why he says, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, no more shellac, no more inheritance, no more portion. Wait a minute, Solomon. What, what about heaven? I think if you held a gun to Solomon's head, or a javelin, he couldn't tell you about heaven. If you go back and read Hebrew literature from the Old Testament, from that time period, there's not much in there about heaven. Most of what we know about heaven we get from the New Testament. So he just sees it as there's no more reward, there's no more inheritance, there's no more portion because nobody knows what's next. Now we've talked about this before, but this is critical for us to understand everything he says and how it infiltrates and it taints his conclusions about life. And the reality is, even in us as believers in Jesus Christ who believe in the gospel, who believe that Jesus Christ died, rose again, went back to heaven, is going to come back to earth, has prepared a place for us, is going to take us there, we still live as if this is where all our reward takes place. And when we don't get it, we get frustrated. And we don't understand, why didn't I get the promotion? Why didn't I get a raise? How come I have to suffer? How come my wife got cancer? How come, how come, how come, how come? And Solomon is a great example of short-sightedness. This myopic, I can't see beyond the end of my nose kind of life that many of us live as Christians and we shouldn't. So he goes on in verse 11, he says, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the strong, the bread doesn't go to the wise, riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. Now what do you think he's talking about? Just the unfairness of life. And, and we read these statements, and they're, they're kind of proverbial in their, their language, but the fastest guy doesn't always win, right? You, you've seen those YouTube videos of the, the guy who trips and falls and he doesn't win the race even though he was the fastest on the track. We know that not always the strongest win the battle. It's the way life is. It's the nature of life. Sometimes the weaker ones win. It's, it's the incongruities, the inconsistencies, and the frustrations of living on this planet. But he says, I've watched this. The wise, wisest person doesn't always get the bread. They don't always get rewarded. And he's going to give us an example of that in just a second. And what he says is that, but time and chance happen to them all. It just happens. So it's interesting that he said, God is eternal. God's in control. God is sovereign. Everybody's under the rule of God, but time and chance happens to them all. Which is it, Solomon? Make up your mind. But see, that's that human perspective that we bring to our circumstances. We, we say God's in control, but then when something happens we don't particularly like, the faster winner doesn't win, we go, well, that's just bad luck. It's just, yeah, it's just bad luck. It just happens. So he's, he's somewhat unsure in his relationship with God. He's somewhat unsure about what he believes about God because he goes back and forth he says, man doesn't know his time. And he's right. I don't know my time. Do you know your time? Do you know when you're going to die? Unless you pl uh, planned your suicide, you don't. I hope you haven't. But we don't know when we're going to die. And then listen to what he says. Like fish that are taken in an evil net. And he's talking about his time. Every man's time. So he compares it to an evil net. Like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time. What does that tell you about his view of death? Is he looking forward to it? He, he got a great view on death? You know, man, take me now, Lord. Yay, Lord Jesus, come. You know, I'm ready. Take me. No, he's like, it's evil. It's evil. Death is evil. Because once death happens, guess what? No more reward. No more shellac. Nothing beyond that. It's an evil time, and it suddenly falls upon you. You're doing your business. You're going about your day, and suddenly, bam, you're dead. And he does not look forward to it. Now, I, I don't particularly look forward to my death, but I don't fear my death. 
I don't go out and flaunt death, but I'm not scared of death because I think I know what's beyond because of what the scriptures tell me and what God has promised me. So he's got this weird view about death. It affects the way he looks at life. And what he concludes is that those who are well-deserving don't always get what's expected. And isn't that true of living in this planet under the sun? This is the way it is that not the people who deserve certain things don't always get it. They sometimes get what they don't deserve. And those who deserve the worst get the best. It's frustrating. It, it, we don't get it. We don't understand it. We don't know why these things happen. And all he can say is it's just a product of time and chance. It's just one of those things. But see, if you take that attitude, then you've suddenly said that God's not in control. That God is aware of what's going on in your life. And God's not, not up in heaven ever wringing his hands and going, oh my gosh, how did that happen? I turned my back and look what happened. Ken's in trouble again. He screwed up again. I can't ever take my eyes off that guy. No, he's in control. It's not a product of time and chance. It's the product of an all-knowing, all-powerful God. And we are not just victims of our circumstances. See, the world lives that way, right? That's the only way they can understand life. It's just, I'm a victim of circumstance. I couldn't help it. I couldn't prevent it. It just happened. But we as believers in Jesus Christ should know better. He, as a follower of Yahweh, should have known better. And having been taught by his father, David, he should have known better that this is not true. We're not all just victims of our circumstances. Go back and read some of your own father's psalms, Solomon. That he understood that God was there with him in the cave when he was hiding from King Saul. He knew that God was protecting him. Yes, there were days when he went, I don't get it, I don't understand it. Where have you gone? Why have you forsaken me? But he always came full circle and said, but you are my rock, you are my fortress. In you, I will find refuge. He knew that God was in control. And when he got the chance to kill King Saul on two different occasions, and his soldiers said, take his life now and you can become king, he said, no, God's not giving me that privilege. He's the Lord's anointed. And when the time is right, in God's timing, he'll put me on the throne. See, that's not chance. That's not just time and circumstances. That's my God's in control. And you and I have got to get that through our heads that whatever happens to you, Tonight, tomorrow, the rest of this week, next week, this month, this year, God is in control and he knows what's going on. And Solomon had lost sight of that. He says in verse 13, I've seen this example of wisdom under the sun and it seems great to me. And he's going to give us a little story. And I don't think it's a story. I think it's a real life situation that he experienced, he saw, and he's going to relate it to you and I. He says, there was a little city with few men in it. And a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. So you got this little city, defenseless, helpless, no army. And there, this king comes against him with all his army, builds siege works all around this little city. And they're in trouble. And Solomon says, but there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no one remembered that poor man. Does that sound like the story of your life? You know, man, I do all this stuff and nobody remembers. I never get credit. I work so hard, nobody rewards me. Well, here's this guy. He saves the city. We're not told what he did, how he saved the city, but somehow through his wisdom, he saves the city and nobody remembers him. And yet Solomon says, here's a great story about wisdom, and I want to relate it to you. He says, I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Even though nobody remembered what he did or what he said or how he saved the city, he saved the city. And that poor man's wisdom is better than the might of the king with the siege works and the army and the greater forces. See, he, he, he knows there's value in wisdom. And I want you to understand there's value in wisdom. But wisdom, apart from God, is worthless. Human wisdom is most definitely worthless. 
But he sees that this, this poor man, whoever he was, even though he, he was forgotten, he saved this city. And he says, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. I don't care how big your army is. I don't care how many siege engines you have. I don't care what you've got to bring against this small town. That one man with his wisdom conquered this army. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. But then listen to what he says. But one sinner... One sinner destroys much good. So he's juxtaposing, you've got this one poor wise man who doesn't get any recognition for what he did, and all it takes is one sinner to screw it all up. See, Solomon looks at life and he understands that, man, wisdom is great, but man, sin is powerful. And I can't read this passage without thinking of a particular event in my life that happened many years ago when I was in my mid-twenties and we were coming to this church and uh, my wife and I had, I think we had two kids at the time and we were in a small group. They met in our home and we were all young couples in our twenties with little kids and there was a couple in that group and he was a American Airlines pilot, former um, Air Force pilot, probably six foot two, Good-looking guy, looked like a model. His wife was gorgeous, had a beautiful little girl, and he was real intimidating. And uh, every time we got together in our small group, he would treat his wife like crap. And he would talk down to her, and he would make fun of her, and he would demean her, and it would make us all so uncomfortable. And every night after we finished, my wife would go, he weirds me out. He just creeps me out. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? The way he treats his wife is just wrong. Uh, yeah, it's pretty awkward. It's, you, you, she, she goes, you need to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> About what? <laughs> About the way he treats his wife. And he always hugs all the women, and he, it's, he's real handsy. I'm like, oh, no, I, you know, you're, no I, I don't think he really is. He's just, you know, he's sarcastic. And she goes, you need to talk to him. And I was just okay, yeah, I'll do that. I never did. And this went on for month after month after month after month, and nobody would say a word, and it got worse and worse and worse. And then one Wednesday night, his wife shows up without him. And she goes, he's left me. He's having an affair with a stewardess. And here's what's the weird thing, is that we sit down, the rest of us in the group, after she left, we prayed over her, she left, and, and every single wife of every single man said, I told you to talk to him. <laughs> and we all went, I was afraid to. I didn't know what he'd do. He might punch me. And we watched a family evaporate before our eyes. One sinner one man. You know, one of the reasons we have you guys sit around tables, and some of you can't stand the fact that we make you sit around tables, is so that you will get to know somebody close enough to that they can speak into your life. And here's what I know about you, because it's true about me, I don't want you to speak into my life. But I need you to speak into my life. I should have spoken into this man's life. Now, could we have saved that marriage? I have no idea. But here's what I know, we never made an attempt. Nobody got in the guy's grill. Nobody got in his face and said, what you're doing is wrong. We never even said the way you treat your wife in our Bible study is completely wrong and it needs to stop now. See, this is, this is probably the most powerful thing to come out of the lesson tonight is if you and I don't bolden up a little bit and get willing to get in each other's face and say the way you're conducting your life is not right. Now, one of the reasons you and I don't want to do that is because when I point at you, I give you the freedom to point back at me, and I don't want you to. Because as soon as I say, well, you know, you got some dirty laundry, you're going to go, well, so do you. And I need to be willing to accept that. And you need to be willing to accept it. Because one sinner destroys much good. Here's one poor wise man that saves an entire city, but Solomon goes, all it's going to take is one idiot. To destroy a marriage, to destroy a family, to destroy a church, to destroy a community. See, both are powerful. Both need to be 
aware of in our lives and in the lives of those we call our brothers in Christ. You see, he says the wise guy, the, the poor man who saved the city doesn't get rewarded. Nobody recognizes him. Nobody remembers his name, but there's value in what he did. Who cares if he got recognized? What if I had been bold enough to stand up to that guy and, and even if he'd punched me in the nose, it would have been worth it if it would have saved that family. But are you willing to take that risk? Are you willing to get into somebody's grill and, and say the things that need to be said? One wise man, one sinner. See, wise people stand out in a crowd. Doesn't mean you're going to get remembered. Doesn't mean you're going to get a, a reward. Doesn't mean you're going to get a plaque on your desk. It just means that you will stand out in the crowd. At least for that day, that wise man stood out. He saved an entire city. But his efforts can be crushed by one sinner. Now let's face it, I don't know how many guys are in this room, but there's more than 50. And we're all sinners, right? Every one of us. And we bring to the table, to the equation, when we walk into this room, our sins, our sin nature, things we thought about today, things we've done today. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ, and I don't want you ever to forget that. But you have got to recognize that your sin has ramifications. When you bring them into this community, into this group right here, unconfessed, undealt with, unrepentant, they affect what goes on here. They affect how the Holy Spirit works in this room. And so the efforts of the wise man can be overshadowed by one sinner who has unconfessed sin, who doesn't deal with it. And then in chapter 10, he's going to give us an example of what that looks like. And I love the metaphor he uses. He goes, dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. He, he loves to write in Proverbs. It's, 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 it's kind of a form of poetry. And, but he, he's making a statement that dead flies, dead flies are not a good thing. Well, they are in the sense that they're dead. But dead flies carry what? Disease. When they're alive, they carry disease. It gets worse when they die. And he says, dead flies make the perfumer's ointment stink. Remember, he talked about ointment, perfumer's ointment before. And he says, now it's, it's what you put on a body to keep it from stinking. But he says, if you get dead flies in it, it's going to stink. And that's what sin does in the midst of the community of Christ. It's a dead fly that makes the perfume stink. And Solomon sees it. He, he's, he's seen it in 70 years of life. We've seen it. We've probably experienced it in our own life. All it takes is one guy. And he says, a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. So now he's moving into, he's comparing the wisdom as illustrated in that poor man who saved a city and the sinner and the fool. And to Solomon, they're one and the same. And if you go read his Proverbs, he's got a lot to say about fools. And if you've never studied the fool in the book of Proverbs, you need to. It's a powerful statement about what it means to live as a fool. And every one of us, according to Proverbs, is born a fool. Your kid was born a fool. The little grandbaby that's going to be born, maybe now, maybe in the next hour, is going to be born a fool. Her name is Evie. Evie is a fool. I love her. I haven't seen her yet, but I love her. But she's a fool because God says we're all born fools without wisdom, without knowledge. And he says, a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. That is not a political statement. Okay. Don't put that on a coffee mug. Don't put it on a plaque out in your front yard. It has nothing to do with what you think it's talking about. He says, even when the fool walks in the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone that he's a fool. Now, he's not verbally saying, hey, look at me, I'm a fool. He just lives his life and he's a fool. Fools are easy to see. And, and the greater they get in their foolishness, the more they shine like fools. They don't think they're a fool. They don't think they act like fools. They think they're wise, but they're not. And their fool, foolishness stands out like a sore thumb. If the anger of the ruler 
rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. He's just talking about, man, if you're going to be one or the other, be wise. Don't, don't, don't talk back to your boss. Don't read your boss the riot act, because he can fire you. Don't be a fool. Be wise. Be careful. Calmness will lay great offenses to rest. And then he goes on, there's an evil that I've seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in low places. He says, fools get rewarded, they get the better job, and those who are rich get demeaned, and they get put in low places. I've seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. I don't get it. And you can hear in his voice, he doesn't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it when fools get rewarded. I don't like it when those who are undeserving get what they don't deserve. They don't get the evil they deserve. They get good things. I don't like that. Neither does Solomon. But here's what I know that I think sometimes he lost sight of. God's in control. God knows what he's doing. Give God time. It's not over yet. So he talks about folly. And he's basically going to tell us that a fool can't be avoided. He will make an impact in your life. If you live like a fool, it will impact the lives of those around you. If you have a son or daughter who is a fool, and if they're born a fool, guess what? They remain a fool until you help them migrate out of their foolishness. And they only get worse over time. Innocent fools, babies, become non-innocent fools. And so we have to help them. And that's why he says, dead flies make perfume stink, a little folly outweighs wisdom, and fools stick out like a sore thumb. They're all around us. And yet, they get rewarded. They end up in high places. They get the corner office. They get things that we think we're deserving of, and maybe we are deserving of. But you know what? I'd rather be the poor, wise man who never gets recognition, and I do the right thing, and I save the city, than to be a fool who rides on a horse, sits in the corner office, and gets all the accolades. Because guess what? Fools destroy communities. They don't build them up. They don't save them. This, this part is one of my favorite parts in the whole book of Ecclesiastes because he's going to talk about work, your work and my work. But he's going to use some interesting analogies. And he says, he who digs a pit will fall into it. That's a job, right? You're digging a pit. But he's got such a pessimistic view on life. Because if you dig a pit, you could fall into it. He's not done. A serpent will bite the hand of him who breaks through a wall. So if your job is to break through a wall, you're working on a construction team, you got to break through the wall, well, you get to the other side, you get bit by a serpent. Solomon, what's wrong with you? Does everything have to be negative to you? Then he says, he who, quarrel, who quarry stones is hurt by them. So you go out to quarry stones and one falls in your head. It doesn't always happen, but it could happen. He who splits log is endangered by them. And then he says, if you happen to split logs for a living and you use a blunt iron, guess what? You're going to have to work harder. What, what's he trying to tell you and I? That these things are inevitable. They're part of living life. Whatever you do for a living, I don't know what you do, but whatever it is, there are occasions when it can harm you. It doesn't always turn out well for you. It doesn't always go well for you. And so he's just saying, this is kind of life. You do your job. You quarry the stones. One falls in your head. One crushes your foot. You go to split logs and you get crushed by a log. Things just happen. And he's not talking necessarily about wisdom or foolishness at this point. He's just talking about living your life under the sun. And he's telling you, though, that wisdom isn't foolproof. It doesn't always protect you from everything. Remember, wisdom's a good thing. It's a gift from God. And it's better to be wise than a fool, but it's not going to protect you from all harm. It doesn't keep you from all occupational hazards that come along. It can protect, but it can't prevent necessarily. You can do your job great and things go south. You can do all the research you need to do to invest wisely and suddenly that company goes belly up and you lose everything you invested. Doesn't mean you're a fool. It's just part of what happens. It's part of life. Because you can't see into the future. 
I can't either. And so wisdom is a wonderful thing, but it's got limitations. And I, I love how he adds in verse 11, if the serpent bites before it's charmed, there's no advantage to the charmer. Just picture that. You're a professional snake charmer. That's your job. You've done it for years. And before you even get a chance to charm the snake, he bites you. And you die. That would suck. But it's part of the job, right? It's part of the risk of the job. So here's this list. Occupation risk. You dig pits, you can fall in. You break through walls, you can get bit by a snake. You split logs, you get injured. You chop with a dull axe, you get tired. You charm snakes, you die. It comes with the territory. Guess what? Whatever you do for a living, there are risks involved. Life comes with risks. It's part of living on this planet. And wisdom can reduce risk. It just won't eliminate all risks. So wisdom is great, and it can help you succeed, but it's not going to protect you from everything. And I think that's part of what drove Solomon crazy, is that he knows he's the wisest man that's ever lived. He's written a book on wisdom called Proverbs, and he still doesn't understand everything, and he still suffers. And he doesn't understand why. Because wisdom is not the antidote to suffering. There is no antidote to suffering. The righteous suffer just like the wicked. The goal is not a lack of suffering, it's the knowledge of God. So wisdom can't protect you from all the risks that come with life. And then he's going to wrap this up and he's going to say, the words of the wise man's mouth win in favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. In other words, they just everything a fool says just ends up coming back on him and destroying him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. He starts out a foolish, in foolish talk, and then he ends in foolish talk. Everything that comes out of his mouth is foolishness. And this is important for us to understand, because again, if you've got kids, you've got to understand that you've got to help get the foolishness out of your child. And you know what the world's primary goal is towards your kids? To keep them fools for the rest of their lives. Did y'all read that story about the guy that was 30-something years old and had to be kicked out of his parents' home because he wouldn't pay rent? And they literally had to take their 30-something-year-old son who would not work and who would spend all day in his house, his parents' house, eating their food, living off their home, their electricity, and playing video games. And he was incensed that they kicked him out of the house. He's a fool. He's what happens when you don't get the fool out of a child because they just become a bigger fool, both literally and figuratively. So a fool multiplies words, though no man knows what's to be. He talks about things he has no clue about. He talks about the future. He doesn't understand it. And no one can tell him what's coming. Because he, here's Solomon, the wisest man in the world. He doesn't know what's coming. How does a fool know? He doesn't, but he acts like he does. And he works, but it just wearies him. He doesn't even know the way to the city. He gets lost going to work. He has no clue what's going on. So foolishness is risky because his words, his speech, his actions bring harm, not only to him, but everybody around him. And he's self-destructive. That's the saddest thing about fools. My, my youngest son, who uh, is now a sergeant in the Marines, when he was going through high school, he went into deep, deep foolishness. And I'm going to show you a chart in just a second that in the book of Proverbs, there are five different Hebrew words that are translated fool. And when we read Proverbs, every time we see the word fool, we think it's all the same word. It's not. It's five different Hebrew words that give us five different capacities of foolishness. And they start on one end of the spectrum, an innocent fool like a baby, all the way to the unregenerate, unrepentant, undisciplinary fool. And my son was somewhere in the middle headed towards the right. I saw it. It was coming. And guys, we've got to work really hard to help them from moving down that spectrum because a foolish person is operating out of a foolish heart. How do we know that? Whatever is in your heart determines what you say. If your kids say stupid things, if your kids say foolish things, if they're two, I get it. If they're 22, there's something wrong with that picture. You need to speak into that because it's, a, it's all about their heart. 
Fools speak because they can, not because they should. And you've probably been around somebody who sometimes says something and you went, oh God, I can't believe you just said that. I can't believe those words just come out of your mouth. Here's the sad thing. There are people who've been around you and you've said things and they went, oh my gosh, I can't believe you just said that. It was foolish. It was wrong. It was unwise. You spoke because you could, but you shouldn't have. And the fool wastes his time because he has no sense. This is the chart, and, and if you want it, you can email me and I'll send it to you. And I'm not going to go through this thing, but it starts with a simple fool. It goes to the silly fool, the sensual fool, the scornful fool, and the stubborn fool. And it is a continuum. You never remain on the left. You move forward. And you end up at the right. And the sad thing about the right is the only one who can deal with the fool on the right is God. He's beyond help. He will not listen to anyone. And so that's why for Solomon, foolishness was such a, an incredible thing. And then he wraps it up, verses 16 and 17. He starts talking about a king who is a child, a king who was made a king as a child. And guess what? If he's a child king, he's a foolish king because children are fools. And he goes, you're a lot better off land when your king is the son of nobility and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Guys, wisdom and foolishness are two options every one of us have every day of our lives. And he knows that wisdom is better. He knows that foolishness is risky and foolishness brings danger not only to you but all those around you. But wisdom is not going to be the anecdote. It's a relationship with God. That's the saddest part about his life is that's what he forgot. A fool will have ramifications from his life. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, and fools, like children, make lousy leaders. And they're all over this country. But wise kings manage their time and kingdoms well. Well, finally, the last thing we're going to touch on is he says, through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. What's he talking about? Laziness. Again, an aspect of foolishness. Lazy leaders result in leaky roofs and a loss of shelter. Foolish leaders end up making unwise decisions. They procrastinate. They put off what they should do. And they do damage, again, not just to themselves, but to everyone around them. So adults are to act like adults, not like children. But sadly, far too many grown-ups still behave like children, lacking self-control and exhibiting simplistic thinking that can destroy marriages, families, cities, and nations. So you can put off your responsibilities as a leader, as a father, as a husband, but you can't put off the consequences. Wisdom, foolishness. Which are you going to choose? Well, I'm going to skip to the end because we're at the end so that you can... Do your discussion questions. And, and this particular topic is, is not a fun topic in the sense of talking about foolishness. Nobody wants to admit they're a fool. Nobody wants to admit that they lack wisdom. Nobody wants to admit that maybe they live their lives as if God doesn't exist or that, you know, I can do this without him. But that's why these questions are so important. So the first one I want you to discuss is the ways in which we as believers can misuse and abuse the good gifts God has given us. Wisdom is a gift from God. It's a good gift. It's a wonderful gift. Use it. But how do we misuse it? How do we become so wise that we don't think we need God? We all live our lives either exhibiting the characteristics of a fool or those of a wise man. What do you think makes the difference and how can we spend less time acting foolishly? This one is huge. If not for you... Think about it for your children. How can you help your sons act less foolish and be more wise in their decision making? And finally, share some practical ways in which we can, use, we can use godly wisdom to impact our lives, our families, our communities, and our culture. How can we do that? Because here's what I know. God wants you to be wise. God wants you to live wisely. God wants you to lead wisely. He wants you to be a wise father, a wise husband, a, a wise businessman. How can we pull that off? What's the key? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the words of Solomon. Thank you, more importantly, for your wisdom that you gave Solomon and that has been imparted through him into this book. Lord, help us to weed through some of his misperceptions and his confusion and help us to understand, Father, that wisdom is a wonderful gift from you. Don't let us abuse it. 
Foolishness is a dangerous thing that every one of us are prone to. We're drawn to it. We're born into it, and it's so hard to get out of it. But everything is possible with your help. And my prayer is, Father, that every one of us in this room, myself included, would become less and less like fools and more like your son, Jesus Christ. So bless the time around the tables, and I pray that uh, it would be a rich time and a sweet time. And I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.